Hello, Moto. The virtual meeting of the Tales Landian Gardens and Galician Siemens community is called to order at 11.38 p.m. A quorum is present. At this time, due to the absence of Sarah and Murphy, the parliamentarian due to her busy schedule tomorrow morning for Easter shopping and spackling the drywall holes in her house, the chair would like to appoint Miss Matson as the parliamentarian for this virtual meeting. At this time the chair would like to welcome myself, Gabrielle Durham, Lauren E. Dushay, Livzy Willigan, Trickshot, That Yoshi with That Blue Helmet, Kyle Smith, Mia Scheidingholm, Dave Madsen, Astro Madsen, 2BCH Hodges, Timothy Lai, Miss Madsen, Jenny Madsen, Darn Pipster, and Talking Angela. In order to make sure everyone is comfortable with our meeting technology, let's review a few options you may need today throughout the meeting. To raise your hand, do so. To unt, click the microphone. To chat, enter something. If there are any other features I plan to utilize, let me know. Lauren E. Dushe, Secretary, will now present the minutes from the last meeting. And Lauren, I know you originated from Canada, and your last name is pronounced that way in Canadian French. There is no need to present the minutes from the last meeting, which is in person last month, in French. Use proper English, okay? In person meeting on March 7, 2022, is 10 minutes. 3 minutes of waiting, and 7 minutes of the meeting. Thank you. Are there any corrections to the minutes? Hearing none, the minutes will be approved as read. Or, if corrections are needed, the minutes are approved as corrected. The draft of the minutes has been distributed for your review. Are there any corrections to the minutes? Hearing none, the minutes are approved as presented. Or, if corrections are needed, the minutes are approved as corrected. The minutes of the prior meeting were approved by us on March 7, 2022. A copy of the minutes are available from the Secretary. Corrections to the minutes should be referred to the Secretary. If there is no objection, the Chair will appoint a committee to approve the minutes of this meeting. Hearing no objection, the Chair appoints Lizzie Willigan, Kyle Smith, and Mia Scheidingholm. Then, appoint a new committee to approve the current meeting's minutes. Talking Angela, Treasurer, will now present the financial report. The beginning balance as of April 13, 2022 is $275.36, total income is $511.57, total expenses are $786.93, with an ending balance of $11,803.95 as of April 12, 2022 in which the Tales Londian Gardens and Elysian Siemens channel got demonetized, just like Pipsters on January 19, almost three months ago, and Super Mario Logans on February 28, 2018, four years ago. Thank you. Are there any questions? I have a question. How did Super Mario Logan end up in and out of the hole so quickly before going to Alex Trebek's locker? Lizzie, on December 11, 2017, Super Mario Logan was almost completely age-restricted by YouTube. On February 28, 2018, the channel got completely demonetized. On August 31, 2018, Super Mario Logan was accepted into the YouTube Partner Program and was finally able to start monetizing on the channel again. It was publicly announced in the Switch. As of August 22, 2019, over 60 videos have been deleted for violating YouTube's terms of service, almost all of which have been age-restricted prior. On February 11, 2021, the channel was renamed to HESML, due to Logan allegedly receiving a cease and desist letter from Nintendo, thus forcing Logan to rename all of his channels to remove any mention of the company's name. On March 15, 2021, the channel was renamed a second time to SML Plus Show, with the logo being swapped out to a black and white version of the previous one, most likely to distinguish channels. Ironically enough, this black and white change happened a few days before the fourth anniversary of when the episode Jeffy Stantrum was released, which is the video that resulted in the demonetization and age restriction of this channel and later caused Logan to change channels. But despite the name changes, 
The channel URL still contained the name Super Mario Logan. Due to the URL still containing the channel's old name and trademark name from Nintendo, the channel was deleted on July 8, 2021 in response to Nintendo's request. All new episodes and remakes are being uploaded onto the new main channel, in which Logan encourages everyone that previously subscribed to this channel to go and subscribe to that channel in hopes of regaining back the almost 10 million subscribers this channel had and getting the diamond play button. Well, as of now, SML's, Darren Pipster's, and Tails Landing Garden's hopes of deleting their channels are gone. If you think the uploader is going to delete the channel, you're wrong. At this time, Tripshop will give report regarding restoration. I move that the action of returning something to a former owner, place, or condition, the process of repairing or renovating a building, work of art, vehicle, etc., so as to restore it to its original condition, the reinstatement of a previous practice, right, custom, or situation, a structure provided to replace or repair dental tissue so as to restore its form and function, such as a filling, crown, or bridge, and a model or drawing representing the supposed original form of an extinct animal, ruined building, etc. will most likely be completely imminent at this moment. Trip shot has moved the restoration of everything should be completely imminent. Is there a second? As a person who is Canadian French, I second that motion to the Canadian English and Canadian French people, as well as the people of the city of Kamloops, British Columbia, Canada. Is there any further discussion? Nope. Are you ready for the question? Okay. Tripshot has moved the restoration of everything is completely imminent all those in favor, say I any opposed, say nay the motion pass or failed. By direction of the Tails Landing Gardens and Elysian Siemens Committee, I move that no company, such as Avalo Breeze Animation, in the Tails Landian River region, should be shut down by the United States Department of Justice. Remember what happened to Mega Upload on January 19, 2012? It got seized and shut down by the United States Department of Justice and commenced criminal cases against its owners and others. Jen Madsen has moved that every company and website should not be seized by the United States Department of Justice and Federal Bureau of Investigation. This comes from committee so no second is needed. Ms. Madsen, would you like to speak to your motion? On January 19, 2013, Mega Upload was relaunched as Mega under the domain name mega.conz later moved to mega.nz, and then to mega.io. The relaunch date was chosen to coincide with the one-year anniversary of Mega Upload's takedown by the U.S. Federal Bureau of Investigation. Alas, you've never seen the piracy is no party screen while playing Mario Party DS. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, Jen Madsen has moved that no other website or company should be shut down by the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the Department of Justice. All those in favor, say I any opposed, say nay the motion had already passed. Talking Angela will now present the budget amendments. A Vela Breeze animation is going up by $961.20. Darren Pipster Studios is going down by $120.21. And Tails Londian Gardens and Elysian Siemens? Bad news, going down by $100 every time due to the complete demonetization. We need to get this solved, pronto. On the other hand, I move that the budget amendments be approved as presented. Talking Angela moved that the budget amendments be approved as presented. Is there a second? Nope. Is there any discussion? Nope. Hearing none, all those in favor, say I any opposed, say nay the motion somehow passed, but in my father's opinion, it failed. That Yoshi with that blue helmet, the chair of the bylaws committee, will now present the report of the bylaws committee. The Bylaws Committee presents the following amendments to the Bylaws and Standing Rules. To reapply for monetization, you should start by going to the monetization page to review the policy your channel violated. Then review your videos with our YouTube partner program policies and our community guidelines in mind. Please also note that standard YPP eligibility criteria of 4,000 public watch hours and 1,000 subscribers will continue to apply here also. By direction of the Bylaws Committee, I move that the bylaws and standing rule amendments be approved as presented. It has been moved that the bylaws and standing rules amendments be approved as presented. This comes from committee so no second is needed. Is there any discussion? All those in favor, say I any opposed, say nay. The motion passed. That Yoshi with that blue helmet, the chair of the bylaws committee, will now present the report of the bylaws committee. Wait a minute, Tailsland. 
Didn't you already say that? These amendments have been distributed to the membership and will be voted on at our next membership meeting on a certain date, thanks to 2 ch Hodges. And Matthew, you don't need to say anything about the bylaws committee because you've already spoken about that. On April 16, 2022, which is today, the executive board voted to only accept notice of intent to run from the floor prior to the meeting, which notice must have been received at least five days prior to the meeting, accept notice of intent to run from the floor from candidates at the meeting, and accept notice of intent to run from the floor both prior to the meeting and at the meeting. Dave, do you approve of all the options listed? I do approve of all three options, Mr. Martinson. If there is no objection, the chair appoints Miss Matson as our teller. We don't need a teller's committee as the computer is tabulating all the results so our teller will only be reporting those results not counting ballots. Parliamentarian, Miss Matson, will now read the bylaws regarding officers and their elections. The election committee shall issue annually a call by mail to all voting members of the Association for Nominations for the Office of President-Elect. The nomination ballots shall provide spaces for at least three names to be listed in order of preference. Forty-five days after mailing the nomination ballots, the election committee shall close nominations and shall make a preferential count of nominees for president-elect. The election committee shall then prepare for the final election ballot, a slate including the names of the five persons who receive the largest numbers of nominating votes. The election committee shall mail to all voting members of the association the final ballot, which shall include nominees for president-elect and may include the names of nominees to such other offices as may be appropriate. The election committee shall determine the eligibility of nominees and ascertain that all the nominees for any office are willing to stand for office. If any one nominee is found to be ineligible or unwilling to stand for office, the name of the person ranking next on the preferential count shall be substituted. And finally, 45 days after mailing a final ballot, the election committee shall close the election and shall make a preferential count of the election ballot. Tie votes shall be resolved by lot. The election committee shall also secure reports from the divisions and from the state and provincial associations of the results of all elections conducted by them. The election results shall be reported by the election committee to the board of directors and council within 30 days after the ballot closes. Timothy Lai, Chair of the Nominating Committee, will now present the report. The Nominating Committee submits the following nominees for President, Tailsland Martinson. For Vice President, Gabrielle Durham. For Secretary, Jenny Madsen. For Treasurer, Talking Angela. Signed, Lauren Eve Darche, Trickshot, That Yoshi with the Blue Helmet, Lizzie Willigan, Kyle Smith, M.I.A. Scheidenhelm, Dave Madsen, Astro Madsen, Miss Madsen and Darren Pipster. Thank you. The nominating committee submits the following nominees. For President, Tails Lynn Martinson. For Vice President, Gabrielle Durham. For Secretary, Jenny Madsen. For Treasurer, Talking Angela. Signed, Lauren E. Dushay, Trick Shot, That Yoshi with That Blue Helmet, Livesey Willigan, Kyle Smith, Mia Scheidingholm, Dave Madsen, Astro Madsen, Miss Madsen, and Darren Pipster. Me, Tails Lynn Martinson, has been nominated for president. Hearing none, the chair declares nominations closed. There being only one nominee, the chair declares me, Tails Lynn Martinson, elected president. Well, I'm afraid that darn pipster is too chicken to be nominated president. Hearing no other nominations, I am afraid that the chair declares the nominations closed. I am also afraid there's no need to give each candidate two minutes to state their qualifications, so that's just the way it is. Well, let me tell all of you something else. We are emailing the ballot for president to the email you submitted when registering for this meeting. You'll have two minutes to cast your vote using the ballot. We'll pause our business to give you time to go cast your ballot. Simply click on the name of the candidate of your choice. Your vote will not contain any identifying information so all votes will be anonymous. Please do not log out of our meeting while casting your ballot. Or simply ask, Alexa, give me the ballot of a presidential candidate. This will happen on May 3, 2022. If there is no objection, the chair appoints Kyle Smith or Mia Scheidenham as our teller, whoever comes first. We don't need a teller's committee as the computer is tabulating all the results so our teller will only be reporting those results not counting ballots. Okay, let's continue on the discussion of the 2022 Russian invasion of Ukraine.
Here's an update on the Kramatorsk railway station attack. As European Council adopted a fifth package of restrictive measures against Russia, President of the European Commission Ursula von der Leyen met President Zelensky in Kiev. The two visited Butch's mass graves where President von der Leyen told reporters that the unthinkable has happened here. Later that day the two held a press conference where President von der Leyen handed over to President Zelensky a questionnaire for joining the European Union. She was accompanied by Joseph Burrell, who expressed confidence that European Union states would soon agree to his proposal to provide Ukraine with an additional 500 million euros to support the armed forces in their fight against the Russian army. On April 9 Russian President Putin appointed Russian Army General Alexander Dvornikov, commander of Russia's southern military district, commander of Russia's military campaign in Ukraine. Vornikov became known for his command of the Russian forces during the Russian military intervention in Syria. Russian forces again hit a storage tank containing nitric acid in Rubazin, according to Serhii Hato, the governor of Ukraine's Luhansk region. He added that the tank contained about three tons of nitric acid, and an update to that dated article, new graves with dozens of civilian Ukrainians was found in Buzova, a liberated village near the capital Kovit that for weeks was occupied by Russian forces. The United Kingdom's Prime Minister Boris Johnson met President Zelensky in Kiev, offering armored vehicles, anti-ship missile systems and promising loans and an easing of tariffs. On April 10 satellite images showed an eight-mile-long Russian military convoy moving south through the eastern Ukraine town of Veliky Berla towards Kharkiv. Valentin Resnyshenko, the head of Dnipro's military administration, claimed that Dnipro airport, as well as the infrastructure around it, had been completely destroyed by Russian shelling. Russia's defense ministry said that Russian Ka-52 attack helicopters had destroyed a convoy of Ukraine's armored vehicles and anti-aircraft warfare systems. The ministry published video footage of Ka-52 attack helicopters flying at extremely low altitude, launching missiles and firing from guns at ground targets. The location and timing of the attack was not specified. Does anyone have anything to add to this day's article? It's about 13 kilometers. On April 11th the Russian defense minister claimed that high-precision sea-based KAL-IBR missiles on the southern outskirts of Dnipro destroyed equipment from S-300 anti-aircraft missile division supplied to Ukraine by a European country, which was hidden in a hangar. Four S-300 launchers and up to 25 Ukrainian armed forces personnel were also hit. The government of Slovakia, having previously confirmed the donation of its S-300 air defense system to Ukraine, denied claims by Russia. Chancellor of Austria Karl Nehammer met with Russian President Vladimir Putin in Moscow, marking the first visit from a Western leader since the start of the invasion. The Austrian chancellor said the conversation with the Russian leader was very direct, open and tough, and that meeting with Putin was not a friendly visit. On April 12 in a telegram statement, the Azov battalion claimed that Russian forces dropped a poisonous substance of unknown origin from an unmanned aerial vehicle onto Ukrainian military and civilians in Mariupol. Petro Andrushchenko, an advisor to the mayor of Mariupol said that city officials were awaiting additional information from military forces, and speculated that in one possible scenario, the discharge of an unknown chemical could be a test for the reaction in general. Meanwhile, the Russian Defense Ministry stated that high-precision air-based and sea-based missiles destroyed one ammunition depot and a secure hangar with Ukrainian aircraft inside at the Starokostyntin of military airfield, Milnitsky Oblast, as well as one ammunition depot near Gavrilovka in the Kiev region. On April 13 according to a statement from the Russian Defense Ministry, 1,026 soldiers of Ukraine's 36th Marine Brigade, including 162 officers, surrendered in the besieged port city of Mariupol. However, the Ukrainian Defense Ministry said it had no information about the surrender. Later that day, Denis Prokopenko, the commander of the Azov Regiment, acknowledged that some Ukrainian defenders had surrendered. Ukraine claimed the Russian guided missile cruiser MOSKVA, the flagship of the Black Sea Fleet, was hit by two Ukrainian Neptune anti-ship cruise missiles, setting the ship on fire. MOS KVA and later suffered a munition explosion due to the fires. Later, the Russian Defense Ministry confirmed that the warship had suffered serious damage and that all its crew had been evacuated, but claimed that it remained afloat, which was confirmed by the Pentagon.
Russia later said that measures were being taken to tow the stricken ship back to port. In an interview, Russia's Deputy Foreign Minister Sergei Rybkov warned that Russia will view U.S. and NATO vehicles transporting weapons on Ukrainian territory as legitimate military targets. He added that any attempts by the West to inflict significant damage on Russia's military or its separatist allies in Ukraine will be harshly suppressed. Ivan Arifiv, the regional military administration spokesperson of Zaporizhia Oblast, said that Russian forces attacked Novodonolivka village in Zaporizhia Oblast with phosphorus bombs. Anything to add to this day's article anyone? You may also see the article on Wikipedia called Russian Cruiser Moskva and 2022 Russian Invasion of Ukraine. On April 14, Russia claimed that two heavily armed Ukrainian combat helicopters entered Russian airspace and conducted at least six airstrikes on residential buildings in Bryansk Oblast. The governor of the Belgorod region claimed that a village there was also attacked, but that no one was injured. Russian authorities accused Ukraine of shelling the town of Klimovo and the village of Spodorshino. Additionally, Russia's Federal Security Service claimed that Ukrainian armed forces had opened fire at the Novayurvichi border checkpoint in the Bryansk region. Russia's Ministry of Defense stated that the Russian cruiser MOSKVA, which Ukraine claimed to have it the previous day, had sunk in the Black Sea while being towed to port. Does anyone have anything to add in this day's article? Actually, I have a correction then something to add. It's not MOSKVA, it's Moskva. I am afraid you got that wrong. Also, Russia's Federal Security Service has an abbreviation, and is FSB. Yesterday, the Russian Defense Ministry claimed that its S-400 defense systems had shot down a Ukrainian Mi-8 helicopter, which was allegedly used to attack the Klimova village in the Bryansk region of Russia. The Russian Defense Ministry also claimed that the Illich steel and iron plant in Mariupol had been liberated from Ukrainian forces implying that Russian forces had taken control of the plant. The ministry also claimed that its strategic rocket forces had eliminated up to 30 Polish mercenaries in a strike on the village of Izyamsko. Ukrainian forces regained control of ruin in Kharkiv Oblast. And finally, today, Russia claimed to have destroyed production buildings of an armored vehicle plant in Kharkiv and a military repair facility in Mykolaiv using high-precision air-launched long-range weapons. Russian officials said that Major General Vladimir Petrovich Verlov was killed in combat in Ukraine. I'll keep you updated when more events turn in Ukraine and Russia. Back to you, Tailslind. Excuse me, Gabrielle, you forgot one. Russia also claimed to have downed one Ukrainian Su-25 aircraft near the city of Izium. Now Tailslind, if you don't mind, continue the meeting with pleasure. Thanks Trickshot and Gabrielle. We now go to Lorani with the recent Megaplode legal case. Thanks, Tailsland. Okay, arrests in New Zealand, acting upon a U.S. federal prosecutor's request, the New Zealand police arrested .com and three other Megaplode executives in a leased $30 million mansion at Coatesville near Auckland on Friday, January 20, 2012, NZDT, UTC plus 13. This was pursuant to a request from the U.S. Federal Bureau of Investigation that the four be extradited for racketeering and money laundering. The raid was timed for the birthday celebration of .com. Assets worth $17 million including artworks and cars were seized. The four men arrested were Kim.com, founder, 38 years old, from Germany, Finn Batato, chief marketing officer, CMO, 38, from Germany, Matthias Ortmann, chief technology officer, CTO, and co-founder, 40, from Germany, and Bram van der Kolk, 29, from the Netherlands. The number of police officers involved in this operation was about 80 according to .com or 20 to 30 according to the New Zealand police. On January 23, .com appeared in Auckland's North Shore District Court for a bail hearing. The Crown argued against bail on the basis that he was a flight risk with a helicopter on his front lawn, while defence lawyers argued that the helicopter could not fly far enough to reach another country. They also said that .com denied any criminal wrongdoing. Judge David McNaughton expressed concern at the discovery of two shotguns at .com's mansion during the police raid and deferred a decision on whether to grant bail, saying that he needed more time to review the submissions. The request for bail was turned down, with Judge McNaughton saying that he was denied due to the risk that Mr. .com would flee jurisdiction and the possibility that if he reached Germany he wouldn't be extradited to face the charges. 
On February 3, 2012, an appeal to the High Court of New Zealand upheld the decision to deny bail. On February 22, 2012, North Shore District Court Judge Nevin Dawson overturned the previous rulings and granted bail to Kim.com, saying that the risk of flight had diminished after his assets had been seized. On March 5, 2012, a formal request for the extradition to the United States of Kim.com and three other senior Megaplode staff was filed in a New Zealand court. On April 30, 2012, the New Zealand High Court ruled that around $750,000 of Kim.com's assets could be returned, including a Mercedes-Benz G55 AMG and Toyota Velfire that had been seized during the raid on his home. The assets in 63 bank accounts and around 30 other vehicles remained in custody. A paperwork error by the New Zealand authorities meant that Kim.com's property had been seized in January 2012 without giving proper notice. The restraining order on his property was granted in April 2012. During April 2012, U.S. District Court Judge Liam O'Grady stated, I frankly don't know that we are ever going to have a trial in this matter, as he found out that the company had never been formally served with criminal papers by the U.S. On June 28, 2012, New Zealand High Court Justice Helen Winkleman ruled that the search warrants used to raid the home of Kim.com were invalid, saying, the warrants did not adequately describe the offences to which they related. They were general warrants, and as such, are invalid. On July 10, 2012, a decision on whether Kim.com and other Megaplode employees should be extradited to the United States was delayed until March 2013, in order to allow further time for legal arguments to be heard. In December 2012, it was delayed until August 2013. In March 2013, .com won a court of appeal ruling allowing him to sue the Government Communications Security Bureau, rejecting the Attorney General's appeal against a ruling in December 2012. On February 19, 2014, a New Zealand appeals court overruled the June 28, 2012 decision, declaring the search warrants against Kim.com to be valid. Dotcom's extradition hearing was set for July 2014. On September 8, 2014, the Court of Appeal ruled that the New Zealand police is to return seized electronic devices unencrypted back to Dotcom and those involved. Basis of Indictment The indictment alleged that Megaplode differed from other online file storage businesses. Media reports covering the case highlighted a number of points from the indictment used to support claims of illegal activity. The indictment provided a number of instances alleged to show criminal behavior, as well as indicating design points of Megaplode's operating model as being evidence of criminal intent. Everyone should explain those to me, starting with you, Trickshot. In practice, the vast majority of users do not have any significant long-term private storage capability. Continued storage is dependent upon regular downloads of the file occurring. Files not downloaded are rapidly removed in most cases whereas popular downloaded files are retained. Items 7 and 8 Because only a small portion of users pay for storage, the business is dependent upon advertising. Adverts are primarily viewed when files are downloaded and the business model is therefore not based upon storage but upon maximizing downloads. Items 7 and 8 Persons indicted have instructed individual users how to locate links to infringing content on the mega sites, and have also shared with each other comments from mega site users demonstrating that they have used or are attempting to use the mega sites to get infringing copies of copyrighted content. Item 13. Persons indicted, unlike the public, are not reliant upon links to stored files, but can search the internal database directly. It is claimed they have searched the internal database for their associates and themselves so that they may directly access copyright infringing content. Item 14. A comprehensive takedown method is in use to identify child pornography, but not deployed to remove infringing content. Item 24. Infringing users did not have their accounts terminated, and the defendants made no significant effort to identify users who were using the mega sites or services to infringe copyrights, to prevent the uploading of infringing copies of copyrighted materials, or to identify infringing copies of copyrighted works. Items 55 and 56. An incentivizing program was adopted encouraging the upload of popular files in return for payments to successful uploaders. Item 69E et al.
defendants explicitly discussed evasion and infringement issues, including an attempt to copy and upload the entire content of YouTube. Item 69 IL YouTube, Item 69 I, J, L, S Counter arguments advanced. Schmitz hired the services of Ira Rothken, an attorney who defended several copyright infringement cases. Rothken claims that the raid was unjustly swift and did not give his client the opportunity to defend himself, quoting a similar case involving YouTube as an example of a completely different turnout. Legal commentators point out that while the indictment may be correct and Megaplode might have acted as a criminal conspiracy as claimed, a number of points in the indictment are based upon selective interpretations and legal concepts, described in one article as novel theories of the law, and could be challenged in court. An LA Times analysis stated that the author was struck by how far the indictment goes to find something nefarious, likewise a tech dirt analysis concluded that while the founder of Megaplode had a significant history of flaunting the law, evidence has potentially been taken out of context or misrepresented and could come back to haunt other online services who are providing perfectly legitimate services. Both analyses concur that other evidence could show criminality, the concerns were not irrefutable. The legal concerns include these you people can tell me. Indictment cites lack of a site search as evidence supporting criminality, but in other copyright cases having a site search has been described as evidence in support of criminality and in Atari v. Rapidshire, not having a site search was agreed by the court as evidence of responsible activity given that some infringing content might exist and be searched for if one existed. In the case of Isand, the presence of a search feature was interpreted as evidence of inducement. Trichter commented that to use the lack of a feature that previously was shown to be a problem as evidence of a conspiracy is crazy. Damned if you do, damned if you don't. The top 100 list excluded copyrighted titles, but the indictment claims this was evidence of concealing, rather than avoiding downloads of, infringing materials. The indictment asserts as evidence that no effort was made to identify infringing files or users, in other words by acts of omission. But federal court rulings repeatedly agree that no duty exists to search these out. In particular, in MGM Studios Inc. v. Grokster, Limited, the Supreme Court looked at substantial non-infringing uses, mere lack of monitoring was not by itself sufficient to show wrongdoing or inducement. It may not be possible, or reasonable to require, the host to know and identify what activity is legitimate or not, as file sharing may be used by many content creators. Deletion after a limited period of non-download is suggested as evidence of a motive. But many legitimate sites such as Imager remove unused content after a while to free up server space. If files were routinely deleted after a short period it could equally suggest legitimate use, because it serves users who share legitimately for a short while and enforces removal afterwards. Much of the indictment, in the words of one analysis, seems to be based on the simple assumption that encouraging more usage means they must be encouraging infringement, in other words there should be evidence of actual wrongdoing, not merely evidence of popular use. Many legitimate files are popular and popularly shared, and an assumption that paid use largely equates to infringing use would need evidence. Failure to remove all links following a takedown request is often legitimate. For example the same content may be uploaded by legitimate and illegitimate users. Removing the infringing link does not affect legitimate uploaders. Removing the infringing file would wrongfully cause it to be deleted for illegitimate users too. Similarly, once child pornography is identified, it is always illegal for all users. But other material may be legal for some users and not for others. So the fact one case requires file removal and the other only requires link removal may well be correct conduct. The indictment includes money laundering charges. But these include basic payments for web hosting, suggesting, lumping in, adding matters that are in no way illegal to make a case look bad. Megaplode had indicated willingness to attend court in the U.S. already and answer civil cases. Safe Harbor Provisions the U.S. Digital Millennium Copyright Act provides safe harbor for sites that promptly take down infringing content. Safe harbor does not exist if the site has actual knowledge and does nothing about it. In Megaplode's case, the indictment alleges DMCA provisions were used for the appearance of legitimacy, the actual material was not removed, only some links to it were, 
takedowns agreement was approved based on business growth rather than infringement, and the parties themselves openly discussed their infringing activities. The indictment claims that Megaplode executives. Mia, can you read the rest? Are willfully infringing copyrights themselves on these systems, have actual knowledge that the materials on their systems are infringing, or alternatively no facts or circumstances that would make infringing material apparent, receive a financial benefit directly attributable to copyright infringing activity where the provider can control that activity, and have not removed, or disabled access to, known copyright infringing material from servers they control. Thanks, Mia. Prosecutors claimed in the indictment that Megaplod was not DMCA compliant, and cited the example of an alleged infringer on the site known as VV. Over six years, VV had allegedly uploaded nearly 17,000 files to megavideo.com, resulting in more than 334 million views. According to prosecutors, although numerous takedown emails had been sent, none of the files had been deleted. In a television interview with 3 News, Kim.com denied being a piracy king and claimed that Megaplode had applied the provisions of the DMCA and went beyond it by giving copyright holders direct rights to delete links. He also claimed that the indictment relied on a malicious interpretation of technical issues to construe its claim of criminal intent and that there was significant legal use of Megaplode. Criminal Defense Action Kim.com denied the charges filed against him and retained the services of Ira P. Rothken an attorney who has defended several copyright infringement cases. Ira Rothken stated that there is no criminal liability for secondary copyright infringement under U.S. law, quoting a similar case involving YouTube as an example of similar accusations which were dealt with as a civil case. Dotcom initially hired Washington, D.C. attorney Robert Bennett, who had confirmed that he was going to represent Megaplode in the piracy case. On January 22, 2012, Bennett withdrew from the case due to a conflict of interest with another client. As of January 23, barrister Paul Davison QC was quoted as representing Megaplode's founder, Kim.com, in New Zealand. At the end of April 2012, a controversy emerged over legal representation. The law firm Quinn Emanuel, retained by Megaplode to argue for the retention of Megaplode's data, claimed in a motion filed to the court that there was a concerted effort by the United States Department of Justice to deny Megaplode fair legal representation. In the brief, Quinn Emanuel alleged that several law firms had dropped out of the case after the DOJ wrote to them over potential conflicts of interest, arguing that they wanted to call clients of the firms as witnesses. Given the size of the Megaplode, Quinn Emanuel claimed that this conflict of interest argument could be applied to any law firm with experience in intellectual property rights, denying Megaplode experienced representation in a case where both law and technical issues are involved. Quinn Emanuel received such a letter but rejected the DOJ's arguments. TechDirt argued that while the founder of Megaplode had a significant history of flouting the law, evidence had potentially been taken out of context or misrepresented and could come back to haunt other online services who are providing perfectly legitimate services. Eric Goldman, a professor of law at Santa Clara University, described the Megaplode case as a depressing display of abuse of government authority. He pointed out that criminal copyright infringement requires that willful infringement has taken place and that taking Megaplode offline had produced the deeply unconstitutional effect of denying legitimate users of the site access to their data. Other legal commentators have disagreed with Goldman's assessment of the copyright charges, concluding that the allegations in the indictment, if proven, would support a guilty finding on charges of aiding and abetting copyright infringement. Professor James Grimmelman, for example, commented, if proven at trial, there's easily enough in the indictment to prove criminal copyright infringement many times over. The defense has drawn on procedural errors by the prosecution to challenge the case. In a judgment in the end of May, NZ Judge David Harvey granted the defendants the right to the disclosure of evidence against them held by the FBI in preparation for the extradition trial. In his 81-page decision, he came to the assessment that the DOJ is attempting to use concepts of civil law, in particular secondary copyright infringement, in a criminal case, which creates legal issues. He also confirmed that the charges in the indictment relating to money laundering, racketeering and wire fraud are not separate criminal acts but dependent on the claim of criminal secondary copyright infringement.
In a separate development in the United States, the defense has challenged the case against Megaplode as a whole, claiming that the U.S. has no jurisdiction over a foreign company and that the seizure of Megaplode's assets was unlawful. A second brief points out numerous legal errors in the indictment, declaring it an experiment in stretching U.S. criminal law well past the breaking point. Data retention, following the seizure of Megaplode, concerns were raised as to what would happen to the files that had been uploaded by its users. On January 20, 2012, the Justice Department stated that, it is important to note that Mega clearly warned users to keep copies of any files they uploaded, adding that, MegaUpload.com expressly informed users through its frequently asked questions and its terms of service that users have no proprietary interest in any of the files on Megaplode servers. They assume the full risk of complete loss or unavailability of their data, and that Megaplode can terminate site operations without prior. Notice. On January 27, 2012, U.S. Attorney Neil H. McBride wrote this note. Miss Madsen, can you read this for me? The mega servers are not in the actual or constructive custody or control of the United States, but remain at the premises controlled by, and currently under the control of, Carpathia and Cogen. Should the defendants wish to obtain independent access to the mega servers, or coordinate third-party access to data housed on mega servers, the issue must be resolved directly with Cogent or Carpathia. In response, on January 30, 2012, Carpathia Hosting denied having access to mega upload files and issued a press release stating what? Jenny Madsen, can you read this note for me please? Carpathia Hosting does not have, and has never had, access to the content on mega upload servers and has no mechanism for returning any content residing on such servers to mega uploads customers. The reference to the February 2, 2012 date in the Department of Justice letter for the deletion of content is not based on any information provided by Carpathia to the U.S. government. We would recommend that anyone who believes that they have content on Mega Upload servers contact Mega Upload. Please do not contact Carpathia Hosting. The Electronic Frontier Foundation has started a campaign to allow legitimate users of Megaplode in the U.S. access to their data and wants the data preserved for that reason. It has chosen to represent one such legitimate user in court and thus has sided with Megaplode and Carpathia in asking the court to retain the data. On April 26, 2012, Megaplode data negotiations began. Carpathia reported that maintaining the data costs over US$9,000 a day and wanted to seek a formal resolution on whether to delete the data or release it to interested parties. United States District Court Judge Liam O'Grady ordered all parties to return to the negotiating table. The U.S. Department of Justice noted that $35 million U.S. million had been paid by Megaplode to Carpathia and alleged that Carpathia had knowingly profited from copyright infringement. Retaliatory attacks by Anonymous Following the shutdown of the Megaplode website, the website of the United States Department of Justice and a number of other websites were taken offline following concerted denial of service attacks attributed to Anonymous. Gizmodo concurred that it was, almost certainly the result of a quickly assembled DDoS, distributed denial of service, attack, and easily the widest in scope and ferocity we've seen in some time, commenting that, if you had any doubts Anonymous is still a hacker wrecking ball, doubt no more. Links posted in chat rooms and on Twitter, when clicked on by unsuspecting internet users, ran a web version of the application known as the Low Orbit Ion Cannon. On January 19, 2012, Anonymous released a statement on pastebin.com accepting responsibility of the mass attacks on websites including those of RIAA, MPAA, BMI, FBI, and others. According to the Russian state-run RT network, Anonymous described the attacks as the single largest internet attack in its history. Other reactions, former French President Nicolas Sarkozy said he was satisfied with the shutdown of the website. He found the site's operators were reaping criminal profits from the illegal distribution of copyrighted works. The time has come for increased judicial and police cooperation between states in the fight against online piracy, he said in a statement. Web organizations have raised concerns about possible effects of the Megaplode case on the future of file sharing, cloud storage, and internet commerce. Various commentators including John C. Dvorak, Glenn Greenwald, and Julian Sanchez have written on the topic as well, 
particularly as it relates U.S. government powers to take down a website without a trial, even without new laws like SOPA.I. In fact, the U.S. Department of Justice was able to rely on PRO-IP, a law passed back in 2008, in order to shut down Megaplod. People who used Megaplode for personal and business storage, such as large audio and video files for family and work, have also voiced their complaints about the fact that they no longer had access to their files on the service. Examples cited in the media included staff at public interest group Public Knowledge who used it for large files, and Android cell phone software writers who described it as one of the best ways to distribute software. There are a number of similar sites for this use, but Megaplode was always the fastest. In response to the shutdown, a number of other file hosting websites changed the functionality of their services. Filezonic.com, one of the top 10 file hosting services, withdrew the ability to share links to files. The site's main page added a banner stating, all sharing functionality on Filesonic is now disabled. Our service can only be used to upload and retrieve files that you have uploaded personally. Other file hosting websites followed suit, including filesofe.com, filejungle.com, uploadstation.com, x7.to and foreshared.com, by shutting down, cancelling affiliate programs or allowing users to only download what they themselves uploaded. Another large file sharing website, uploaded.to, ceased services for users accessing from United States-based IP addresses. BT Junkie, a website indexing torrent files, shut down voluntarily on February 6, 2012. The file hosting site TurboBit.net blocked access to U.S. visitors, and Quicksilver Screen, a site offering streaming video links, closed one day later. However, other file hosting companies felt no need to change, with Mediafire's CEO Derek Labian saying that he and his file hosting company are not concerned by the Megaplode incident because Megaplode was making a ridiculous amount of money with a ridiculously bad service. We don't have a business built on copyright infringement. A spokesperson for RapidShare similarly expressed a lack of concern, saying that file hosting itself is a legitimate business, pointing out that Microsoft's OneDrive operates on a similar basis. This concludes this discussion. Back to you, Tailsland. Thanks, Laura Neve. The Treasurer will now present the proposed 2022-2023 budget. There is no greater testament to the grit and resilience of the American people than the extraordinary progress we have made together over the last year. America entered 2021 in the midst of a devastating health crisis, on the heels of the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. We ended 2021 having created over 6.5 million new jobs, the most our nation has ever recorded in a single year. Our economy grew at a rate of 5.7%, the strongest growth in nearly 40 years. As of February, the unemployment rate has fallen from 6.4% when I took office to 3.8%, the fastest decline in recorded history. We are bringing everyone along, and leaving no one behind. Child poverty is projected to reach the lowest level ever recorded, while long-term unemployment, youth unemployment, and black and Hispanic unemployment have all dropped at record rates. Though family budgets are still tight, millions more Americans are earning paychecks today, and families have more money in their pockets than they did a year ago. This progress was no accident. It was a direct result of the new economic vision for America I ran on, to build our economy from the bottom up and the middle out. That vision was reflected in the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021, which lifted our nation out of crisis, fueled our efforts to vaccinate America and combat the COVID-19 pandemic globally, enabled small businesses and state and local governments to hire, rehire, and retain workers, and delivered immediate economic relief to tens of millions of Americans to put food on their tables, keep a roof over their heads, enable them to work by keeping schools and child care providers open, and maintain their dignity in the face of the pandemic. That vision was also reflected in the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, the most sweeping investment to rebuild America in history. After years of merely talking about fixing our infrastructure, we brought together Democrats and Republicans to finally get it done. Already, 
that law is paving the way for better jobs for millions of Americans, modernizing roads, bridges, ports, and airports. Building a national network of charging stations, so America can own the electric car market. Replacing lead pipes across the nation, so every child can drink clean water at home and at school. Providing affordable high-speed internet for every American and strengthening our resilience to withstand both cyber and physical threats, including the devastating effects of the climate crisis. There have been challenges as we have recovered from the COVID-19 pandemic. Due to the speed of our recovery, businesses have had a hard time hiring workers quickly enough to keep pace with resurgent demand. Disruptions to global supply chains have also contributed to higher prices. As a result, America was not immune to the worldwide inflation that has followed the pandemic, leaving too many families struggling to keep up with their bills. Since January, that pain has also been compounded by the anticipation and aftermath of Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine, from the time he began amassing troops on Ukraine's borders, triggering a response in global oil markets. The price of a gallon of gas has risen by more than a dollar here at home as of mid-March. Today, however, as a result of the new economic vision we are building our economy around, we are well positioned to meet the challenges and seize the opportunities of this decisive decade. We are competing with China from a position of strength, while leading a global coalition united in condemnation of Russian aggression against Ukraine. We are tackling the climate crisis with urgency strengthening the global health architecture to combat COVID-19 and future pandemics, and enhancing cybersecurity and addressing emerging cyber threats. We are joining with allies and partners to write the rules of 21st century economics, trade, and technology. My budget details the next steps forward on our journey to execute a new economic vision, reduce costs for families, reduce the deficit, and build a better America. It is a budget anchored in my bedrock belief that America is at its best when we invest in the backbone of our nation, the hard-working people in every community who make our nation run. My budget lays out detailed investments to build on a record-breaking year of broad-based, inclusive growth, and meet the challenges of the 21st century. It is a call to reduce costs for families' biggest expenses. Grow, educate, and invest in our workforce. Bolster our public health infrastructure. Save lives by investing in strategies such as community policing and community violence interventions, strategies proven to reduce gun crime, and advance equity, environmental justice, and opportunity for all Americans. As I discussed in my 2022 State of the Union address, my budget also reflects a bipartisan unity agenda, areas where we can all come together to make progress. That includes investments to help beat the opioid epidemic. Take on the invisible costs of the mental health crisis, especially among our children. Support our veterans. And end cancer as we know it. My supercharged cancer moonshot plan has a goal of cutting cancer death rates by at least 50% over the next 25 years, while my vision for ARPA-H, the Advanced Research Projects Agency for Health, seeks breakthroughs in cancer. Alzheimer's, diabetes, and more. Critically, my budget would also keep our nation on a sound fiscal course. It fights inflation and helps families deal with rising costs by growing our economy, making more goods in America, and lowering the costs families face. Its bold ideas are fully paid for, with tax reforms that more than offset the cost of new investments. It fulfills my ironclad promise that no one earning less than $400,000 per year would pay an additional penny in new taxes, while ensuring that the wealthiest Americans and the biggest corporations begin to pay their fair share. It keeps us on track to reduce the deficit this year to less than half of what it was before I took office. After a year of historic progress, I am more optimistic about America today than I have ever been. We are on a path to win the competition for the 21st century. We are prepared once again to turn a moment of crisis into a breathtaking opportunity. We are stronger today than we were a year ago, and we will be stronger a year from now than we are today. All we have to do is keep coming together, to keep building, keep giving working families a fighting chance.
and keep expanding the possibilities of our nation. That is what my budget is all about, and I look forward to working together to keep delivering for the American people. In that case, I move that the proposed budget be adopted as presented. The treasurer has moved that the budget be adopted as presented. Is there a second? Nope. Is there any discussion? Nope. Hearing none, all those in favor, say I any opposed, say nay the motion passed because we need to do this. Do get our channel out of quarantine and Kevin restriction measures. A few announcements, whatever is demonetized, stays demonetized. It's a spin-off to what happens in Vegas, stays in Vegas. Next announcement regarding Breeze Airways, Breeze's route map is about to change dramatically with the addition of its first destinations in the western U.S. and its first cross-country flights. In a major expansion, the airline on Tuesday said it is adding flights in 10 new cities including Las Vegas, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Nashville, Tennessee, and Jacksonville, Florida, and boosting service in others, including Charleston and Hartford, Connecticut. In all, Breeze is adding 35 routes between May and August, nearly doubling its flight lineup. The airline will offer 77 routes in 28 cities and 18 states when all the new flights are in place by early August. By the end of the year, the airline's fleet will more than double, from 13 planes to 30. And here's an announcement regarding Avelo Airlines, beginning in May, Avelo will add exclusive non-stop service between HVN and two South Carolina destinations, Myrtle Beach and Charleston, as well as Savannah. Georgia slash Hilton Head, South Carolina, and Nashville, Tennessee. Today's announcement expands the Velo's East Coast network from HVN to 10 exclusive non-stop destinations. A Velo currently flies between HVN and 6 Sunsoak, Florida destinations, Fort Lauderdale, Fort Myers, Orlando, Sarasota Bradenton, Tampa and West Palm Beach. The three new routes are significantly different from its current focus on Florida, Charleston, Myrtle Beach, and Savannah, and they bring to 13 its route network from the Connecticut Airport. The announcement comes ahead of two additional routes being revealed later this week from Burbank. Avelo's routes from New Haven are... Drumroll please. Avelo's in expansion mode again, with Baltimore, Chicago Midway, and Raleigh-Durham all to launch at the end of May. When writing ahead of the official announcement, the exact timings aren't known. However, one-way base fares, including only a small personal item, are available to Baltimore from $49, Raleigh Durham from $59, and Chicago from $69. The details are on www.simpleflying.com. Back to you, Tailslind. Thank you, Gabby. Anyways, is there any further business? We use the Chrome Audio Capture extension to record sounds that are hard to find, expensive to download, or whenever there isn't a download button anywhere the website the sound is at. Whenever our channel is demonetized again, we quarantine the channel for 14 days. If it gets monetized again, we are back to normal routine. Well, Pixar's channel closure seemed to be a false alarm. However, TVC T-Rail equipment they got from Mark, New Jersey Transit, and other commuter railroads like SEPTA still remain the same. Saturday Murphy is the host of all TVC T-Commuter Rail, Bus, Subway, and Light Rail operations. You are all welcome to contact her for any questions regarding transportation, round trip, one-way trips, and others. Now with that, the meeting is adjourned at 12.04 a.m. on Sunday, April 17, 2022. Have a great evening and a safe Easter Sunday. And speaking of videos, this one is almost an hour long. Have a happy Easter. Goodbye. Never give up. Trust your instincts. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned for more. Goodbye.